introducing our guest speaker tonight. Rhonda is at home sounding like she has a mouthful of jello and she's trying to talk through it and it's not particularly attractive. So she got a hold of Margie and said, could you please cover Wednesday night? And, and of course Margie said yes. And so we are very privileged and excited to have Margie Balderrama here tonight. So welcome Margie, everybody at home clap. Thank you. However, I do not believe and feel like I am a guest. <laughs> I have been a part of Bethel and the Bethel family for many years. So I am just grateful and thankful to be able to be a part of the body and the family here and, and just appreciate Pastors Mike and Rhonda allowing me to be able to come. Amen. And so um, I just believe in the name of Jesus, her voice is being restored and everything that's behind that. And so just want to welcome you tonight, those who are live stream and those who are here. Um, last Wednesday, of course, we didn't have a Wednesday night Bible study because Thanksgiving was the next day on Thursday. And so um, hope you all had a good Thanksgiving Thursday last week. And um, if you're anything like me, there are leftovers that are still being eaten <laughs> in our home. So I tried to toss some on Monday, but um, there were still some good ones that we kept to, to finish off through the week. So uh, with that, the two Wednesdays prior to um, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, I have started uh, speaking a message that was in, that's titled, Jesus Says I Will. And just to recap a little, the neat thing about live streaming is you can go back and watch those services. So therefore, you can pick up where you may have missed any of the scriptures or uh, the beginning of the, the teaching that started those two Wednesdays uh, prior to last Wednesday. So I'm not going to take a whole lot of time recapping, but just kind of to bring it up to date and, and just what I want to share with you tonight uh, concerning it. But Father, I just thank you. I thank you so much that you love us, you care about us. I thank you that you are right here with us, in us, and for us. I thank you that your love is so great and mighty and it never fails. And so I just pray tonight as your word is coming forth, that Holy Spirit, that you just cause illumination, revelation, understanding, wisdom, and just the manifestation of, of imparting what you desire for us to receive and those who are watching and listening, even questions that they may have had. But I just believe tonight that there would just be a, a deepening of our love and falling even more in love with you, Jesus, as you are just being revealed through your word and, and how much you care about us and every person watching and, and how you have made provision for every area of our lives. And you are right here, right now, and at this time, in our lives and for everyone that, that you came and gave your life for the whole world and you are very present. So I thank you, Holy Spirit, that as your word just flows forth from my mouth that, that it is piercing the darkness, your words are, and that it is bringing light and deliverance and healing and freedom and everything that you are sending it to do in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, um, like I said, the title is Jesus Says, I Will. And I had shared scriptures on the first uh, Wednesday that I started teaching this was out of Matthew chapter 8. And just sharing with the different healings that were taking place at that time, uh, starting with in the Matthew 8 verse 3 where the leopard, the man who had leprosy had uh, approached Jesus and and said to him, if you are willing, you can heal me. And Jesus reached out and touched him and said, I am willing, be healed. And then from there, it went on to the officer, the Roman officer who had come to Jesus concerning his servant who was at home sick and was needing to be healed. And when Jesus said, I will go to your home, I will come with you, the soldier said, no, no need for you to come if you'll just speak the word because I'm someone under authority and I recognize the authority that you have, that you walk and that you use. So if you'll just speak the word, I know he'll be healed. And then Jesus marveled at his faith and, and and just spoke the word and he said because he believed the the officer believed he says go back home it has happened your servant is healed 
And then in the same chapter, Jesus goes to visit Peter's home and his mother-in-law is lying there sick with a fever when he enters into their home. And it says, Jesus touched her hand and the fever left her. And immediately she got up and began to serve him and to wait on him. And so Jesus says, I will, while he was walking the earth, the signs and wonders and the casting out of demons and the raising the dead and the healing the sick were things that he was doing even before he died on the cross. And here he was doing it in the presence of his disciples and, and letting it be made known what his will was. And then he goes over, um, then over again in Matthew 10, it says in verse 1, And when he had called the twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. And this is still before Jesus ever went and died on the cross. This was before he was ever taken, um, you know, by the Jewish leaders to be crucified. And then verse 5 says, These twelve sent out and commanded them, saying, don't go into the way of the Gentiles. In verse 8, it says, he told them, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. He's making it clear to them, you have received this. I'm giving this authority. I'm telling you to go and to do this. And then in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, again, it says, after these things, the Lord Jesus appointed 70 others, also and sent them two by two before his face into every city. And in verse nine in Luke 10, he says, and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you, which means the kingdom of God is here, which was Jesus bringing the kingdom of God. Verse seven in that same chapter says, then the 70 returned and with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them in verse 18, and he said, eight, he said, um, 18, I'm sorry, that was verse 17, this was verse 18. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice just because the demons come out but rejoice that your names are written in heaven is what he said to them. And so I was sharing this to begin uh, when I started in this teaching, Jesus said, I will, because this is while he was walking on the earth. This is while he was in his physical body and, and had not even gone to the cross, hadn't uh, paid for our sins. And yet he was saying to them, I'm giving you authority. And even before their very eyes, he was giving of himself, walking in the authority of casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead where they could witness it with their physical eyes. And then he sends them out and gives them the charge to go and do the very thing that he has been doing before their very eyes. And so that brings us over to John the 14th chapter. And uh, I don't know if Jack has those scriptures, but I started, um, if you want to go to John the 14th chapter, and this is in the um, New King James Version, and I'm going to start over at verse um, 9. Jesus said to him, because Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Because Jesus was talking to them about, if you have known me, you know the Father. So verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else... Believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Verse 12. Most assuredly, this is Jesus talking, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask 
anything in my name, I will do it. And this is what Jesus is saying to them while he's still present on planet Earth. They've been watching him cast out demons, heal the lepers, raise the dead, and then he sends them out, not just the 12, but then 70 at one time he sends out. So now he's saying to them, them not knowing what's about to take place in his life, that he will be crucified, they, he will no longer be walking on the earth with them as they knew it. So he's saying to them, I say to you, the works that I do, you will do, and greater works than these, because I do go to my Father. And whatever you ask, that word ask is not talking about a petition, a prayer. That word ask in the Greek means whatever you call for in my name, whatever you demand in my name, I will do it. He just finished telling them the works that I do, it is the Father. It is he who does the works. It is he who does the authority. It's the authority. I'm not on my own authority. I'm on his authority. I'm coming with his authority. So he's setting this example before them. And he's telling them now without them realizing what he's setting this up for and why. And then he says here in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you. And then he says, and will be in you. He's not in them yet, but he's telling them he will be in you and I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And so I said, as I was sharing this the last time, that this whole scripture in John 14, the passage that I'm sharing with you about Jesus saying the works that I do, you shall do also. Well, immediately after the day of Pentecost, this came a manifestation through them, which was Peter and John. So I talked about Acts chapter 3, and, and over in Acts chapter 3, I don't want to read the whole chapter 3, but this is a story of a man who was lame from his mother's womb. So he had never walked. He was born that way, right? Had never had been able to stand on his own two feet, but was set at this gate called Beautiful, where he begged for alms. And so Peter and John were about to go into the temple, and they, the man was asking them for alms. And verse 4 says, And him fixing his eyes on him, when John Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold. I do not have, but what I do have. And remember over in Matthew 10, when Jesus sent them out and he said to them, heal the sick, right? Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Freely you have received, freely give. So then here Peter is saying over here in the book of Acts, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, Acts 3, down at verse 16, if you'll go down to that verse, if you have your Bibles or those watching at home. And this is Peter now sharing what has taken place to this man. Because many saw what had happened, and here he begins to preach this sermon of what has taken place concerning Jesus and what they did to Jesus and how it's possible that now this man is on his feet walking. In verse 16 he says, and his is, I'm going to start off actually, verse 14 to take you into 16. But you denied the Holy One and the just, meaning Jesus, and asked for a murderer to be granted, which was Barabbas, to you when they had an option to choose whether or not they wanted it to be Jesus or Barabbas and killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. Verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So tonight, what I would like to focus in on, because it's so, you know, so vitally important 
uh, especially where we are today. And, and knowing that what's been going on in our world, in our nation, the pandemic, you know, the, the virus, so many lives have been lost. Um, so many people, you know, have, have tested positive and they're experiencing symptoms and these different things going on. And, you know, the first Wednesday that I began to share this message, you know, I was just led by the Holy Spirit to talk about the Lexus that the Lord had blessed me with, um, a, something material that wasn't even anything I was asking for or even needing at the time. But his purpose for doing that was at that time in our country, we were in a recession. The housing market had begun to, you know, plumb plumbered down and people were losing their jobs and the whole one of the reasons the Lord did that was so that the body of Christ could know that God was not in a recession and that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the word of God is settled forever, and he doesn't change. And no matter what's going on in our world or in our nation, our circumstances in our lives, the word of God is settled. And everything Jesus did on that cross in his finished work, his death, burial, and resurrection, and now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, seeing to it, because he is the executor of the new covenant. The New Testament is in him. He is the way that the truth and the life and all power and authority has been given unto him both in heaven on earth and beneath the earth that there is nothing greater you know in the book of Colossians it says that he is the head of principality power might and dominion that means there is no equal to him there is nothing above him there is nothing greater than him all the power and authority has been given unto him so tonight what I would like to share with you and that's why I started off by saying even in my prayer that I believe that it's going to come us to fall even deeper in love with Jesus. You know, because the more he's revealed and his great love he has for us and he has for you and his care and concern that he made provision so that no matter what's going on in our lives, in our world, in the circumstances, that he is available, that he has already gone before us and already knows, of course, everything that's coming up, every second, every minute, every hour. He's aware of it and he's made provision because he's a good God and Savior and he's a good help. Heavenly Father and Daddy. He's a better parent than any one of us could ever be because he knows everything. He created us and he's for us and he's with us. Amen. It didn't mean we would be on the earth and there not be trials and tribulations and troubles, but he said, I will be with you in trouble and I will show you my salvation. I will make and have made a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. But that doesn't mean bearing it being miserable. That doesn't mean bearing it meaning suffering in a way that it's like, oh my gosh, I have no more hope, or I'm in despair, or there's just everything looks so hopeless and utterly no way out. He didn't mean it that way because he gave us his peace. He gave us his joy. And he said, I'm going to send a helper, the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you forever. And he's not right now, he dwells amongst you, but he's going to come and be inside of you. Because I will not leave you without comfort. I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you as orphans wondering where is our help? Who's going to be with us? Who's going to take care of us? Who's going to help see us through this? No, I have sent you the helper. And I just want to share tonight along these lines with the name of Jesus. And why? Have you ever asked yourself the question, why was he given the name above every name? I don't know. I'm sure many have asked that question and have even had it answered. But tonight I want to share with you even more so, you know, why he was given that name. So in Philippians chapter 2, um, I want to read starting at verse 1. And I'm going to go down because this is a beautiful, beautiful word of why. Why Jesus? One of the reasons why he was given the name above all names. So starting here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, I'm in the Amplified Bible because I like the way it amplified it, right? 
It says, let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interests, but also each for the interests of others. And I just thought this was really wonderful too, because Pastor Mike has been teaching on even the greater works and the works that we do and the mean the love of God and serving one another. And that goes beyond just the works of the big gifts per se, spiritual gifts and all that's included and all that's from God. But do you know the new covenant and in the epistles is always something up the love of one, loving one another and what we do for one another because we're the body of Christ. And I love it too because see, just like in the beginning when Adam sinned and Eve was deceived, it affected the whole human race. So there wasn't ever any time in the mind of God that anyone would be an island unto himself. You know, many times I would hear someone say, mainly teenagers and even myself growing up, well, what I do is my business and it's not affecting anybody. But see, that's not true, right? That isn't the truth because we're all connected. Or I love this. One time I was doing a session, uh, had a wonderful time with the Girl Talk Girls one day, and I, and I was sharing with them, you know, about how Ancestry.com, if you look it up, it'll help you find your genealogy and your ancestors and what country and nation and what blood relatives you come from. And I said, do you know there was only one man and one woman ever created? I said, and then if Ancestry.com could go really all the way, well, all the way, all the way back, you would see literally our bloodline goes back to one man and one woman because there was never another man or woman created. And because of Adam's sin, his disobedience, sin entered the whole human race, even though we were not back there to make a decision about it or not because God created us as the whole human race. That's why there's only one body of Christ, not three and four, <laughs> one body of Christ. And do you know the Bible even says that we're a part of the family of God and the body of Christ is in heaven right now. We're still all one body, even though parts of our body are in heaven right now in the family of God. I want you to think about that. It's only one body. And we're a part of it, no matter who you are, the color of your skin, your nationality, what nation or world you're in. If you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we are one. And we have the blood of the Lamb flowing in our lives. Amen? So if you ever thought, well, I need brothers and sisters, hey, you got a lot of brothers and sisters. But so much of the new covenant is emphasized about us as the body, loving one another and giving it to one another. So anyway, that was just a side note from what I'm wanting to talk about as well. But verse 5, let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility, who although being essentially one, listen to these words, who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant slave in that he became like men and was born a human being. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should, must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue frankly and openly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. This is one of the reasons why Jesus has been given the name that is above every name that can be mentioned. 
whether it's a disease, whether it's in poverty, no matter what the name is, Jesus' name was given because he humbled himself. He stripped himself of his privileges and came from heaven to be put in the likeness of human flesh, nine months in his mother's womb, born, natural birth, nursed at her, had to have diapers, I mean, went through it all as a human being because of his love and because he was obedient to the cross. It says that God has exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. So when Peter was saying this name and faith in this name, and over in the book of John, as I was reading in 14, the works that I do, you shall do in greater works than these because I go to my Father. That whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything, if you call for and demand anything in my name, just like you saw me cast out devils, just like you saw me raise the dead, just like the leper was healed and it was one of the most horrific type diseases and the most contagious type of diseases that if you touched it, you could get it. But when Jesus touched it, it didn't get on him. His healing, his divine life, his love, it got on the leper and healed him. And Jesus is saying this, right? And when you speak, and so this name, the name that is above every name, that when I speak that name, when I speak to that sickness, when I speak to that pain, you know, it's amazing because in Matthew 8, when, this, when the satyrian soldier said to Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. If you'll just speak it, if you'll just say it, I know it'll be done because, see, I'm someone under authority and I recognize the authority that's on you, so I know that if you'll just speak it. Well, you know, when he said the works that I do, we're in a pandemic time and, and it's been declared all the more, you know, coronavirus, you can't go, people have to quarantine, you can't go to the hospital, and you know what? That doesn't stop Jesus. That doesn't stop God because he said, just as I spoke to the centurion servant and I said that healing would be, would be in that servant and that servant would be raised up out of that sickness so do you and are you able to speak my name and expect what I have sent it to do to happen because the spirit of God as Jesus said my father who is in me he does the works it's his, his authority and Jesus is saying right here just as what I was doing just what you've seen me do you will do if you call for and command in my name, I will do it. It is Jesus. It is the Father. It is the power of God. It is him who does the works, not us. He has given us his name, the name that is exalted above every name, in heaven, on earth, and beneath the earth, which means it all has to surrender and submit to his name. You know, the thing about this is, like everything else, in our identity, in our relationship with the Lord. You know, it says in Romans, the 10th chapter, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The faith of God is already in us, in our new created spirit. And as we hear the word, as you're hearing the word about the name of Jesus, and many times, you know, things can become so familiar, so routine. I don't know about you, but that happens with me. You know, where I can get so used to doing the same thing, speaking the same scripture over and over, and there comes a time where it's like dull to me. You know, or it comes a time where it's like, you know what, case of all, yeah, that's right, that's right. But you know, the word of God is alive and living. And there are many times I have to step back. And as I'm looking in the word and spending time in the word, or I'm talking to the Lord about, well, what does this mean? Like asking the question, well, why did God give Jesus the name that's above every name? You know, asking that question and then reading right here one of the reasons of why he was given that name and that there is power in that name, but that he gave us authority of his name. When we speak the name of Jesus, you know what that calls for and what is going on and what says, what's being said? We're saying by the authority of Jesus that all he is, 
who he is and what he is and by all the glory of his throne in heaven. We are saying by the power of him that created the heaven and the earth and all things that exist, including angels and mankind, that all has to listen and bow to his name. All has to, and he proved it over and over when he walked on this earth. So then Peter's preaching and saying, this that you see, you know, the one you murdered, the one that you were willing to not give up the, the murderer instead, you know him, that one, it was because of faith and belief in his name that this man is walking. The same yesterday, today, and forever is what the Bible says concerning Jesus. There isn't any word of God that has waxed cold or that has become minimized as far as God is concerned. You know, and it's really something because being in the midst of when it looks like the majority of what is around us, more negativity or doubt or unbelief, and the very things we're seeing with our eyes and hearing with our ears are for real things that are happening, but yet it didn't change that Jesus still is the one who provided healing and redemption, is the one who has still given us authority. I don't know about you, but pretty much on a daily basis, I'm speaking death to coronavirus virus in the name of Jesus because it's a name that is beneath the name of Jesus it's a name that we've been given authority to tread up on serpents and scorpions and all the works of the devil and I have to be honest with you in the beginning of all of this and I mean fear came knocking at my door against my mind and especially when my sister had it and was on a ventilator for seven weeks and then talking to her and listening to her when she couldn't even talk because of a trach and her just having to tap with me through the phone. But her wanting me to pray for her and me taking the scriptures of the word of God. But how God used Lucy Rael three years prior, two years prior to that to call her name out. And realizing that that word at that time was for this season and this time that this was happening in her life. See, God is a God who is the God of health and wholeness and healing. And it is his will because the price has already been paid for through his son. So when people say, I'm going to suffer for Jesus, it doesn't mean suffering for Jesus through sickness, disease, or accidents, or anything like that, because Jesus already suffered that. It doesn't mean you're a martyr if you die from a sickness or a disease, because a martyr is someone who dies for the sake of Jesus' name, because he's put up against a place where either you're going to stand for your God or we're going to take your life, or it was better that we be martyred than to say, no, we're not going to bow to this. Not through sickness and disease, that's not being a martyr and the suffering that the Bible talks about that we go through right many times it is the hurt it is the pain it is the doing without or it's watching other people suffer or those type of situations or things but Jesus made it clear all through the gospels while he walked the earth that sickness and disease were not from him he doesn't give it he doesn't put it on people to destroy their lives he is healer how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth Acts 8 38 says with the Holy Ghost with power See, their acts are 10 38. See, their acts 8 are 10 38. But how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power to go about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And now he's given us his name. We, his sons and daughters, have been given the name of Jesus. And I just want to encourage you, if you haven't in a while, to take time to meditate on that again, to look up those scriptures that talk about Jesus, that talk about his name. And because in John 14, he was setting them up and getting them ready because he was going to be leaving, but letting them know, you have been watching me. You have been seeing the works that I do and the works that I do are my father's works. It is through his authority. Then he goes down and says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to come. He's going to be with you. Well, do you know who the Holy Spirit is? He is God's spirit. The word of God says the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in us. And it says the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. The spirit of who? The spirit of the Father. Hallelujah. 
God's Spirit, Holy Spirit, who lives and dwells in us, who resurrected Jesus Christ, raised him from the dead. Romans 8 says the same Holy Spirit lives in you now. The one Jesus said in John, he will be in you. He's been dwelling among you, but now he's going to come and be in you, and he'll never leave you. And since he's the Spirit of the Father, the works that I do, you will do, because it's the Father's works. It's the Spirit of God in us who does the works. Hallelujah. You know, I remember as a younger Christian, I was reading in the book of Acts. And I remember reading all the stories and all the, the just miracles and healings. And I mean, the preaching and that the, the disciples, the apostles were doing. And I remember I looked at the title of the book of Acts. And it said, the book of Acts. Not the Acts, A-X. A-C-T-S. And it was like, Wow. This book should have been named the Acts of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> but Acts means the actions. The actions. But it was the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who was doing the acts through the apostles. But because Jesus claims us as one with him. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> you know, because we're one with him. Paul writes, we were crucified with him, Galatians 2.20. He said, I am crucified with him. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's Jesus again. You know, it's amazing because everything was created by Jesus, for Jesus, from Jesus. And he is the one that God has exalted, raised him up and seated him at his right hand. And he says to his disciples, to us, the works that I do, you will do and greater works. And so I was just meditating on this and, and I've been seeing evidence, greater evidence of manifestation of this part of speaking the word of God, speaking life speaking, commanding the sickness and disease because people can't get near people. They're not even letting family members go into the hospital. And I want to encourage those who are watching live stream and even in here, don't surrender, don't retreat, don't back down. Greater is he who is in you. And the name of Jesus is alive and living and powerful. And the demons have to bow to his name. And sickness and disease has to bow to his name. And more and more as we're meditating, and this is becoming a greater realization, I am telling you, the word of God says that when we believe that in our heart and we speak it, it happens. You know, the, the, I believe it's in Colossians where it says, as you, as you have received Christ Jesus, continue to walk in him that way. Well, how did we receive him? We believed it in our heart and confessed it with our mouth. It's that, it's that same simplicity. It's just that, you know, there's been things waged more on this topic of salvation, eternal life, more so than on maybe prosperity weighing over here or sickness and disease and healing here. See, at the same time, on the same day, on the same cross, we are just as much saved, sozo, eternal life, living forever in heaven, healed as we are saved. And it's a beautiful thing because the Lord is wiping out a lot of religious teachings that have made it hard or it made it seem like it was almost impossible or to even think of ourselves as being one with Christ. He was joined to the Lord and the Spirit of God is one. Did you see it said that Jesus thought it not robbery? I mean, God wants us more walking in the revelation and the reality that we are one so that we can, he can be free to live through us and we get out of the way and realize it's not about us, that he has saved us, redeemed us, and, and made us righteous with his righteousness, and he sees us right as one with him. That's why in 1 John 4, 17, he says, as you are, so am I, as he is. So am I, not in heaven, but here in this life on this earth. 
Glory be to God. There is a world that needs the sons of God and the truth of God and the light of God and the love of God and the power of God coming through the body of God. Woo, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. And he is doing it. Amen. <laughs> because I refuse to settle because he paid such a great price to claim me and make me his own. What love. And I'm learning how to embrace it without fear or condemnation or bringing my selfish self and ways into it. Because it's all about him. And he loves me. I'm so in love with Jesus. <laughs> and he's so in love with me. I didn't used to know how to say that. But I can say that because of learning and receiving that it's not about me. I am his. I died and I am hidden in Jesus with God. You know, I was reading a little bit today out of Ephesians where Paul, you know, this, I don't know, many of you have been in the body of Christ long enough to remember when there was such a friction between women preaching because Paul said no women should teach and have authority over a man. Oh, man, I remember when that was not in this church as much because Pastor Annie had been up here for years, but just the misunderstanding and the context of that and why he was saying that in that day to those women, right? And then he starts talking about the law. And I love the illustration that he gives about the law. And if you go and reread it, right? But he's talking about as long as a woman and a man are married and the man is still alive, she cannot get remarried because then she would be considered committing adultery. But then he says, but if that husband dies, she is free to remarry and it will no longer be adultery. He said, so it is between the law and grace. He says, so that when, if you are dead, you died because of sin, and now Jesus is your life, and you've been made the righteousness of God, and you've been made so since you died, you're no longer a debtor to the law. You're no longer married to the law because you died. And he was saying it's the same way with the curse of the law, sin and death. Now you are the righteousness of God, and you've been made alive. So you're no longer a debtor to sin. You're no longer a debtor to the law because you are dead, and you are free to marry grace. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? I know it's so exciting for me. But <laughs> that's good news. You know why that's good news? Because you're not captive. You're not a prisoner. You've been set free to a lover who was willingly and freely came from heaven, stripped himself of his own privileges and power, and was willing to go nine months in a womb. Thank God we never remember being in a womb. There's a reason for that, right? I've never met a person who said, I remember in my fourth month of pregnancy in my mother's womb, I remember her eating jalapenos. No, no one can recall when they were in the womb. No one. But he had to come out and he had to grow and he lived on this earth. God himself. Because he loves us so much. It's amazing. If you would just, you know, take some time to just free your mind up one day. Forget about the dishes for a moment. Forget about whatever. And just start thinking about, God, you love me. You're so in love with me. And I know there's a lot of hurt and pain. I know there's a lot of wrong that's been done. I know that there have been people who have had parents or didn't have parents. People have been abused. People have been abandoned. I know there's a lot of hurt and pain. I know there's a lot of disappointment and anger. Maybe you're even mad at God. Maybe the God that was presented to you was a God that was angry, was a God that was selfish or mean, or that tried to require something from you that you couldn't give. And I am telling you, you know, we do the best for what we know at the time. But I am telling you, if you look in the Word... He is so wanting to reveal to you how good he is and how much he loves you and how much he's for you. 
See, it, it is through faith. It is literally through faith that we receive access to the truths of the word of God because God's word is spirit. And as you're born of God, and that battle goes on with your carnal mind, with the unrenewed parts of our mind that want to put judgment, that want to punish, that want to tear down, that want to condemn. See, that's not God. But if I'm not renewing my mind or I'm not hearing truth of the word so that it's bringing life and it's revealing to me, wait a minute. This is who God is. This is his nature. This is his character. He's a good God. He's not punishing me. He poured all my punishment into his son, and his son was willing to come, asking nothing. But because we are his creation, and he was unwilling to do without us. See, he's a good God, and he keeps his word. See, we live in a society at a time where lying is celebrated. But God is not a liar, neither can he ever lie. And everything he's written in his word and fulfilled, he has done it. And I am telling you, my brothers and sisters and those who are watching, there is a day of reckoning where the Lord Jesus Christ will be coming back. But until he comes back, he is still lavishing his love. He is still pouring his favor. He is still approving and accepting and pursuing and chasing after whosoever will let him be their God because he is just so in love with his creation. But yet, too, he gave us a free will to choose. Even as a Christian, we still have a free will. He made it clear that he paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. But if I don't get into the word, or if I don't hear teaching, or if I'm not spending that time, that's, all I, that's the only part I have to do. He can't do that for me. I can't give you revelation. I can share truth with you from God's word and believe Holy Spirit is taking it, but I am still the one who has to act on it. And it's okay right where you are because he meets you right where you are. And I just want to say to you tonight, there's a name, the name of Jesus, that is the same Jesus name who was in Jesus when he walked the earth. God didn't change his mind about you. Healing is the children's bread. And we as believers have freely received. We have freely received. That's why he said, you lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I can't give something that's not in me. And if it's in me, then that means it's for me as well to walk in divine health and wholeness. Because the Bible says in 1 Peter 2.24 that he has already healed me. Himself bore, bear my sins in his own body on the tree, that I might be dead to sin and live to righteousness by whose stripes I was healed. You were healed. You are healed. And that won't make sense to the natural mind and to what's going on in the body or the mind or whatever is going on. It won't make sense because the carnal mind is enmity against the things of the spirit. And that is why the just shall live by faith. You are a man of faith. You are a woman of faith. You have the faith of God. And as you're hearing the word of God that is alive and living, concerning this is calling that faith to rise up where you're able to take a hold of and say, wait a minute, I am a child of God. I am a daughter. I am a son of God. He's redeemed me. He's taken all of the darkness. He's delivered me out. I died to sin and I'm alive unto righteousness. It's the gift of God. You know what a gift is? It's not something you earn. It's not something you work for. God so loved the world that he gave the gift of his only begotten son, that we received the gift of righteousness and his mercy. See, a gift is given by the one who purchased it, who paid the price for it. The next scripture I was going to go into and just touch on is that you've been redeemed by his blood. God required blood for the remission of sins. And Jesus' blood was enough once and for all. And we've been redeemed. You know what that word redeemed means? I loved it. I looked it up and I like the definition that it says in that word redemption. It means to possess or buy something 
or buy something or possess something that once was yours. Isn't that awesome? Because we were once gods. Adam and Eve were created, and they were not created to be sinners. They were not created to be in darkness. Did you know that's not what they were created for in the beginning? But because of Adam's disobedience and Eve's deception, sin came in. But that's not what God created them for. He didn't create them. So what did he do? He bought us back through his son's blood. We were ransomed. We were redeemed. And now we have redemption through the blood of the lamb. So tonight, what I want to leave with you and impart with you is the name that is above every name. Why he was given. One of the reasons why Jesus is the one who has the name above every name. And why principalities, powers, mights, and dominion are beneath Jesus and have to submit to his name. And just as the man who was lame at the gate called Beautiful, who looked at them expecting, and he said, silver and gold we have not, but such as we have, we give it unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up, and he reached right out and took him by the hand. Right? That's us. We've been given that name. Faith in that name causes people to be born again, causes people to be healed. We're in that process. And you may say, I've been saying that name and nothing's been happening. No changes. I'm tired of saying that name and nothing working. I hear you, brother. I hear you, sister. Start where you are. I encourage you, meditate on that. Take that word. Look at it. Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are a disciple of the Lord. And he has given you his name. And I know there's gifts of the Spirit, there's the working of miracles, you know, there's the gift of faith. I'm talking about specifically just what he said here. Even in Mark 16, Jesus said, go and make disciples, and these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name, you will cast out demons, you will speak with new tongues, you will lay hands on the sick. You know why? Because there is a harvest. You know, the pandemic's not going to last forever. This church is going to have people running into it because of hearing that there's a God who loves them and a Savior who came for them. And they're going to come into the arms of the loving Jesus through his body in this place. And a body who is aware of, wait a minute, such as I have, freely I will give to you. Right? His name and his blood, we have redemption. And that's the good news. It didn't change. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, you have access to the name of Jesus. I just pray, Father, for a holy boldness. A holy boldness of the minds being renewed to get the vision of identity that we are in Christ Jesus. He didn't make the gospel hard. He didn't make salvation hard. He didn't make it hard to receive and walk in divine health and wholeness and healing. And thank you, Lord, that we say yes and amen. And according to your word, be it unto us as our minds are being renewed, as we are taking action and not letting fear stop us because of the love that you want us to give one to another and to a world that needs Jesus and a world that needs to see there is a bomb in Gilead. There is a Savior who has risen with healing in his wings and he has a body that is alive on planet earth who are not afraid to be water walkers and take the name of Jesus and say silver and gold we don't have. Although, you know what Lord? <laughs> because there are people who will have nothing that will need something. And we thank you that during this time we refuse to retreat. We refuse to back down. We will continue to speak the truth of the grace of the glory of God and your love and your mercy that you are a healing Jesus, a forgiving Jesus, that you are a lover who never stops loving. 
So, Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. That we will not take what you have imparted lightly. I pray, Father God, that your name, the name above every name, that your blood that has redeemed us and that your desire to move through your body is a living reality, not just with a few, but that everyone listening will know, yes, you, you're the righteousness of God. Yes, you're the disciple of the Lord. Yes, his name is alive and living. Yes, coming out of your mouth. Yes. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go, Pastor Mike. Good Lord. Well, thank you, Margie. I was just sitting down there thinking the most important thing any of us can ever know is what God thinks about us and how he wants us. And you know you're starting to get there when you think that can't possibly be true, it's too good. That's when you're starting to get there. And so thank you, Margie, for that message. Very encouraging, very instructive. Uh, before we wrap up tonight, we can take the opportunity to give to support the work that God's doing here. He makes it very clear in the Bible that when we give to support the work he's doing, there are special blessings that come all over us because he likes his people involved. And it is our privilege, it is our opportunity to give of our finances, of our stuff, to help this message go out. And that's why Bethel's here. So you can give on the app, you can give on the website. Um, it's, it's all the standard stuff. It's the same every week. But we really, really appreciate your gifts and your generosity and we know that God is blessing the people of Bethel and the people that join us on the live stream. Even if they're not here, God knows you're watching and God is speaking to you and God appreciates it when you give. So we thank you for that. We look forward to seeing everybody on Sunday morning, whether it's on your computer or if you happen to sneak into the room on Sunday morning when we're doing the live stream. We won't tell if you won't. And it is the first Sunday of December, so all our special Christmas stuff starts this Sunday. And we're going to have a great time this month. So I look forward to seeing you, and I hope everybody has a great week. And remember how much God loves you. Have a great evening, folks. Good night.